morning and welcome as we gather for our online worship here on Sunday, June the 4th, 2023. As I shared last week, we are celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion today. So if you haven't already done so, if you've maybe forgotten over the course of the week, make sure you pause at some point in the video or you can pause right now and get some bread and some juice or wine so that you are ready later in the service to celebrate the Sacrament of Communion. Also, we're continuing our series on trust today, and I hope so far you have learned so much about various ways that you can continue to choose trust, even as we face some very difficult challenges in our lives. Something we got coming up at our church very shortly is our church garage sale. That's happening on the final Saturday in June. So if you're out and about on that Saturday morning, please stop by the church and see if there's any treasures that you would like to purchase. But if you have some items around your house and you want to donate them to our garage sale, we need them kind of sooner than later. If you can get them to us as quick as possible, that'd be wonderful and great because as you can imagine, there's a lot of time into such an event and a lot of pricing that's going on right now. So, lots going on at our church, and today is also Food Bank Sunday at our church. So, if there's ever a time that you have some items for the food bank that you would like to bring to the church, we'll make sure we get them there for you, but it's always the first Sunday of the month. Well, it's time to begin worship, but before we do, let us start with a moment. A prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, how good it is to be with you. We know, God, right now we are in your presence and we are giving you the gift that puts a smile on your face and a gift that puts a smile on ours too, and that is worship. Because the moment we stop and pause like this, our shoulders just go down because we feel at peace. We feel the strength and joy that comes knowing that you are going to speak to us, that you are going to enlighten us, you are going to empower us and strengthen us in the ways that only you can. So God, may we give you the best of ourselves in this worship, the best of our time, the best of our love, and the best of our devotion. We offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let us continue our service now as we sing Welcome to This House, followed by Holy, 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 and our opening hymn for today. Thank you. 
Heavenly Father, we know, God, that you call us your children. And just to hear those words, we just smile at that thought. What a gift, what a privilege, what an honor it is to be children of the most holy and high God. And we know that as our Father in heaven, that you give us your perfect instructions, holy commandments to live our lives by. They are a reflection of how we should live our life with you in a proper relationship and how we can live in a proper relationship with one another. And we know, God, these are commandments we should hold high and honor and obey each and every day, like not use your name in vain, but how many times in the course of a day or course of a week do we use your name in vain and realize we have sinned? Or that we should not tell a lie, how many times do we tell those little white lies and just try to make things easier for us, maybe avoid ramifications, but then realize at those moments the mistake, the sin we've done? Or we should not covet what others have. And in this world where so many people have so much, maybe we are coveting a lifestyle, maybe we are coveting possessions, maybe we are coveting certain things other people have that we think are advantages and privileges they have that we don't. And as we covet, we sin. Or maybe there's unforgiveness that is still flowing in our hearts from a past hurt. And as much as we know the commandments are meant to show love for others, we're not feeling that love in our heart for that person. So God, for the ways that we have sinned this week, we know that before we can give you the worship that you deserve, we need to confess our sins and be purified, be cleansed. So God, once again, we bring before you any and all sins and submit to you with repenting hearts how sorry we are in asking for your holy forgiveness. Thank you, God, for being the God you are. So generous, so grateful, so kind, so caring. Bless each one of us with this gift of grace. Help each one of us to embrace it in the ways that you want us to, so that we live more righteously, we live more forgiving, we live more loving. We offer this prayer in Christ's name, who taught each and every one of us when to pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
weeks we've been looking at memory verses from the Psalms. Or sorry, from Proverbs. Boy, I got my P's wrong there, didn't I? Usually it's mine, my P's and Q's. But so we're looking at Proverbs, and today we're going to be looking at Proverbs 11, verse 30 to be exact. And this is what it says The seeds of good deeds become a tree of life. And when I read this, there's two things that really stood out to me. One thing is, as we know, the gift of salvation is not a result of our good deeds, is it? It is a result of Christ's good deeds by dying on the cross for our sin, giving us the gift of salvation by believing in God through Jesus Christ. So, we're not saved through our good deeds, but what should happen as a result of our salvation? that we want to show good deeds to others. It's the way to repay that debt to God. It's the way to show our love to God for this incredible, amazing love that he has shown us. And as we see, the seeds of good deeds become a tree of life. And we think of seeds being planted in these days and times. Absolutely, this is planting season, and maybe we've already done some planting outside in our gardens. And then what are we looking for? For those seeds to begin to sprout. And whether it's flowers, whether it's trees, whether it's vegetables, or so on, we're beginning to look for them to come to life, for them to be a blessing. And something that we need to be more conscious of is those good deeds that we do each and every day. And how they become a symbol of the tree of life to others. You know, sometimes... It's just saying a kind word to somebody. That can be a good deed. Last night I was at an event and somebody was sitting all alone and I took the time to just spend time talking to this person. And you could just tell it meant something to them. A good deed that just lifted that person's day. Or maybe sometimes it's just as simple as holding a door open for someone and saying thank you. Or wishing them a good day. These good deeds don't have to be the big things. They can be just little things. But they keep adding and adding and adding and giving life, giving meaning, giving purpose, giving hope to people. And as we know, good deeds don't save us. But they are a symbol, they are a sign of the tree of life that will be standing around one day in heaven, won't they? And may that be a reminder to us to be conscious each and every day to just do some good deeds, say some kind words for others, so that they can experience the blessings of the tree of life. That is our memory verse for today. Well, for our story time, I've been pretty busy this week, and my wife Nadine has been far, far, far more busier than me, because something we've been doing is preparing my mother-in-law to be moved, and she was in the process of being moved this past week. And if you can remember the process, if you've experienced it lately, you know there is a lot of packing. And when there's packing involved, what are you looking for? What are you searching for? Boxes. And over the past several weeks, I can't tell you the number of times I've stopped into grocery stores or dollar stores to see if they've had any spare boxes that we could have so that we could pack some of the items at my mother-in-law's place. Now, as you know, when you go to a grocery store, when you go to the dollar store, they come in many different sizes and shapes, the boxes. For instance, we all know what those banana boxes are like. Or, sometimes you get boxes that are very tall, others they're very small, and as you see, sometimes you get boxes like this that you know that maybe it's only good to pack one or two items, very small, but you know it's going to be safe and secure. So, so many boxes, and with the boxes, you got to find the right items to put into it so that those items will be safe and secure in the move. Now, with all the boxes that I've had to find, all the boxes that I've had to pack and lift, you know, it got me thinking about boxes. And, you know, something that we may do with our faith is put it in a box. And I remember an analogy, I remember a saying that came across my desk one day, and it says, 
how people will put Jesus in a box, so to speak. And what do I mean by that? Well, as we know, at Christmas time, we have boxes to pack things in, right? To put our gifts in. And what do some people do? They put Jesus in a box for 364 days. And when Christmas Eve comes, they open the box and pull out their faith, pull out their love for Jesus. But after Christmas is over, they place them in a box again. Or maybe they have two boxes. And that second box is an Easter box. And then they just move it after Christmas to the Easter box. And then when Easter comes, they once again pull Jesus out of the box and come to church, express their faith. But put Jesus back into the Christmas box and know maybe eight months later, it'll be coming out of the box, their faith again. But we sometimes do that with our love for Jesus. But sometimes we put Jesus in a box and say, Jesus, I'm just going to put you aside for a moment. You know, I'll come to you. I'll get it. I'll retrieve it. And then when I need you, Jesus, I will open the box. I will open the lid again and let you know what I need. I'll maybe spend some time with you in prayer that you can help me with a trial or challenge. But right now, I just need to put this aside. I'm going to keep you in a box, Jesus. And sometimes we also take this approach by putting Jesus in a box. We think that a problem is too big. And because of it, we think, well, I'm just going to keep Jesus in a box. And a box has sides, it has limitations, right? Again, what's in the box stays in the box. It is only so big. It can only do so much. And we think sometimes that with Jesus. We put him in a box and then see a problem and think it's too hard, it's too difficult for Jesus. Instead of taking Jesus out of the box and realizing nothing is impossible for him. So, over this week, with all the boxes I've been selecting and getting, all the boxes I've been lifting and carrying and transporting, it's got me thinking a lot about what are each one of us doing when it comes to Jesus? Are we putting him in a box and only opening him at Christmas or Easter? Do we put him in a box and put aside our faith and only bring it out in times of need? Or do we sometimes think, no, Jesus cannot come out of the box? This problem is too hard for Jesus, and we keep him in a box instead of allowing Jesus to be our solution, to be the answer to our prayers, to be the one who can help us in any and all situations. So, as you see boxes, as you look at boxes around your house, one thing it should make you ponder, are you putting your faith in a box? Are you making Jesus and your relationship with him in a box? that only you open at your choosing in time. If we are, then we're missing out on the incredible relationship we can have with Jesus. Let's never put our faith in a box. That's our story time and pondering time for today. Well, let us continue now as we sing our next Well, hymn. before we look at our scripture reading for today, let us come before God, shall we, in our prayer for understanding. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many things that we have learned so far, for the chance to get to sing and lift our voices in worship, for the story time that we've learned about a message through boxes through our memory verse, through the prayers that we've prayed. Yes, God, we are learning and we want to learn so much more because we realize, God, that this is the way that we grow in our faith. This is the way that we get a faith that truly matters in our lives. So, God, we ask that you open our ears and our hearts and our minds so that we can take in any and all truths that you want to share with us this day. We offer our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we continue our series on trust, I want to look at a story today from Mark chapter 5. It's the story of two people who had tried everything when it came to healing. One was a synagogue leader named Jairus, whose little daughter was gravely ill. He had tried everything, and then Jesus came to town. And the same with a woman 
who had suffered from chronic bleeding for 12 years. She, too, had tried everything else, and nothing had worked. And then Jesus came to town. Let us see how we can still trust when everything we else tries has come up a failure. Mark 5 started at verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with them. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet, you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then, the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, kum, which means little girl. I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely amazed. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're starting our series, and we're building our fourth weekend in our series on trust. And remember, as believers, trust should be our greatest strength and asset. And the reason why is because through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, he has opened up to us a path, a way into the inner sanctuary of God, the throne room of God. And if we make a choice, to anchor our soul to the throne of God or to the promises of our God, then what our soul is anchored to is stronger than any storm we'll ever face. So, that is why trust should be our greatest strength and asset. But, we've been learning over the past three weeks how there are certain situations, there are certain challenges that can come into our lives that can erode away at our level of trust and result in fear instead of trust. We saw one example with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when, knowing the cup of suffering was fast approaching and how whatever our cup of suffering is might cause us to lose that level of trust as well. Then, we stood with Moses at the Red Sea and realized that even when we have an enemy behind us or a challenge behind us, 
mountains to the right, mountains to the left, and no clear paths forward, we can still choose trust because God will open a path for us. And then, we looked at last week, when it seems like nothing is happening on God's end, remember the story of Abram and Sarah. And when they discovered nothing was happening on God's end, what did they do? They took matters into their own hands and made the situation worse than better. But we learned some important lessons. That like Hagar, if it seems like nothing is happening on God's end, just to cry out in prayer, be honest, and to remember God's faithful attributes. Because if we do these things, we'll stay patient until we see God bring and fulfill His promises. So as we see, if we are going to maintain trust in some very difficult challenges and circumstances, it's important to learn why we can trust in any and all situations. And today, we're going to look at another scenario that can cause us to lose trust. And that is when all else has failed in our lives. And I think, as you can begin to see, the story that we read today is a perfect example of how we can still trust when all else in life has failed. Now, the story begins when Jesus has arrived by boat to the other side of the sea. And by this time in Jesus' life and ministry, he's very popular. So much so that everyone gathered to greet Jesus when he arrived. Well, one of the people that were part of the crowd was a man named Jairus. Now, Jairus was the leader of the local synagogue in that place. Now, in those days and times, the synagogue was not only the place where people came to worship on the Sabbath. It was also used during the week like a school, a place of learning. And as you can imagine, it was also the social hub of activity through the course of a week. So, the leader of a synagogue would have been very well known. So, you can imagine, Jairus would have been the equivalent of, say, a mayor in a town or village or city. Very respected, very well known, very recognized. But, when he arrived that day, it wasn't to announce a greeting or to greet Jesus and welcome him to their town or village. No, he came in desperation because his little girl was gravely sick. And we see the desperation on Jairus' part when we read this. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. As we see, desperation on his part, falling to his knees, pleading with Jesus fervently. Now, we need to imagine that he had tried everything up until this point to have his daughter healed. That's what any parent would do. Any father, any mother would try any means to have their child healed. And with Jairus being as well known as he is, well connected as he is, would have tried any means. Money would not have been a matter, wouldn't it? But what did we learn at this point? Everything he tried had failed. And now he was desperate. We see it in his words. We see it in his actions. But do you know another reason we know how desperate he was at this point? The fact that a synagogue leader like him came to Jesus. And why do I say that? Well, by this time of Jesus' ministry, Synagogue leaders were being told by the Pharisees to have nothing to do with Jesus. You see, they didn't want Jesus to get credibility. They didn't want Jesus to become popular like he was, as well known as he was. So, Jairus was probably told at some point before this, have nothing to do with Jesus if he comes to your town or village. But the fact that he realized Jesus could help him. We see he was desperate. He put aside whatever the Pharisees would say to him afterwards because he was desperate. All else had failed, and he needed his daughter healed. But he was not the only person in the crowd that day who had tried everything but had come up empty, had come up with failure. The other was a woman who had been suffering from a chronic bleeding condition for 12 years. Now, because of that condition, 
she would have been socially isolated. She would have been prevented from having social interaction during those 12 years. Can you imagine how lonely? Can you imagine how difficult it would have been for her seeing other people part of society but being excluded from it? But we're told she went from doctor after doctor. She sought healing in so many ways and she spent every dollar she had. And I'm sure every doctor or physician at that time said, yes, I can heal you of your condition. And every time it came up with a failure. And she too was desperate at this time. So, here are two people that had gone through very tough circumstances in their lives. They had tried everything for healing when it came to the daughter, when it came to the chronic bleeding condition, and everything they had tried had failed to that point. So, remember, the series is on trust. Did they trust Jesus at this moment to heal them? Even though everything else they had tried had failed up to that point? Yes. And remember, trust needs to be a choice and decision. And we see the fact that they trusted Jesus at this point based on their words and their thoughts. Remember when it came to Jairus. When he was pleading fervently with Jesus, remember what he says. If you just lay your hands on my daughter, she will be well. Isn't that a statement of trust? If you just lay your hands on her, she will be healed. He trusted, and we see it in his words. Now, we don't hear the words of this woman who had suffered from chronic bleeding, but we are given her thoughts, because remember what she said. If I just touch the hem of his robe, then I will be healed. Once again, she believed and had trust that Jesus would heal her if she could just touch the hem of his clothes. So as we see, in their words, in their thoughts, they had made the decision to trust. Now let me ask you this. Had Jesus healed them at this point? before they made the decision to trust. No. Jesus had not healed either of them at this point, prior to them making the decision to trust. So, why? Why were they able to make the decision to trust, as we see in their words and their thoughts, even though Jesus had not healed them yet? For this reason. It's what they were focusing on. They weren't focusing at this moment on their past hurts and disappointments. What were they focusing on at this moment? Jesus as a healer. And that is why they were able to trust even before the healing happened, even despite all the past hurts and disappointments and failures, they kept their focus on Jesus as healer. And as we see, if we are going to trust through very difficult circumstances in our lives, even if we've had setbacks, even if we've had disappointments and some failures along the way, our ability to trust will depend on what or who we are focusing on. Are we focusing on all the disappointments or are we focusing on Jesus? and what Jesus can and will do. Because what were they focusing on with Jesus? The healing that would happen. And that shows their trust. Because isn't trust and faith really? Believing in the unseen. Believing in what Jesus hasn't done yet, but that we believe he will do. And this is a passage that reminds us about this from 2 Corinthians. We set our eyes not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. What we see will only last a short time, but we cannot see will last forever. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. So, as we see with this, the reason why, despite all these setbacks, all the disappointments, all the failures, they were able to choose trust at this point, they focused on Jesus in their past hurts. And they were focusing on what 
They couldn't yet see that Jesus would eventually heal in these situations. And was their trust well placed? Well, it was. Because remember what happened. When this woman suffering from chronic bleeding did, she reached out and she touched Jesus' robe. And as suddenly, immediately, she was healed. And remember, Jesus confirmed this because he acknowledged that power had left him at that moment. And he turned to find who had touched him. And then he engaged in a very personal and wonderful conversation. And it is too bad that we don't have the full conversation. Because you can just imagine that he must have listened to her story. Listened to her thoughts. And then he said this to her. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Here's a woman who had tried everything else up until this point to be healed. But then... She decided to focus on Jesus, the healer. She put her trust in what she had not seen yet. And as we see, trust became her greatest strength and asset, and it resulted in her healing. Now, it's the same said for Jairus. Because as we know, as Jesus was engaged in this conversation with this woman, he, Jairus, received news from messengers who came from his house, and they came with terrible news that his daughter had died, that his daughter had passed away. And Jesus could overhear it. And he could see what these messengers were saying to Jairus. And it's interesting what Jesus said to him at this moment. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. And isn't it surprising that what Jesus was really saying to Jairus here, make trust your greatest strength and asset, even in a situation like this. Because how would Jairus have viewed this? Maybe. As another failure. Because as I acknowledged before, up until that point, we have to assume that he had gone to doctors. He had tried treatments for his daughter. Any parent would have. He had come up with failure. And in this situation, he probably saw it as another failure. And that's exactly what his messengers were saying. Don't bother the teacher anymore. So, he had to make a choice or decision. Who does he listen to in this moment? Does he listen to his messengers? And maybe say to Jesus, well, thank you, Jesus. We tried. And maybe if we had not been interrupted, then maybe this would have worked out. I know that you meant well, but it just ended in failure. And then he could have went back home and grieved with those who were grieving there. That's what he could have done if he listened solely to the messengers. But remember, Jesus was saying to him, don't be afraid, just have faith. And who he listened to in that matter made all the difference. Because who did he listen to? He listened to Jesus. Don't be afraid, just have faith. And it's important for us to remember this as we go through setbacks and challenges in our lives. Because one thing people will do is offer so much advice to us when we experience setbacks and failures and losses in our lives, and they mean well. People will mean well with it, but we need to make sure in these situations we're not neglecting to listen to Jesus' voice too. Because Jesus may be saying to us, I know what all the others are saying to you, but let me tell you what I am saying. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Just trust. Keep trusting. Make it your strongest and greatest strength and asset. So, when we come into these situations, let's make sure that we follow in Jairus' situation. Which voice are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to others' voices or to Jesus? And which voice we listen to will determine whether trust is our greatest strength and asset. But, there's one more lesson that we learn from this story. That if we listen to Jesus rather than listening to others, we will begin to see Jesus can do for us what nobody else can. And that becomes so evident in our story. Because 
Up until that point, the crowd was following Jesus and Jairus to his home. But as soon as Jairus made this decision to trust Jesus, here's what happened. Jesus stopped the crowd. He prevented the crowd from following him the rest of the way. And the only people he allowed to go with him was Jairus and Peter, James, and John. Then, when Jesus got to Jairus' house, naturally there was people outside wailing and crying with grief. And when Jesus said to them, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? This little girl's not dead, but just sleeping. Everybody was laughing at him and mocking at him. But what did Jesus do? He took control of the situation and he threw the people out. Now, the verb used in Greek for throwing them out is the same verb that was used in the story where Jesus cleansed the temple. Do you remember the money changers? Do you remember the vendors in the temple where Jesus threw them out? This is the same verb used for how he threw those out who were grieving and wailing. So, after he did that, Jesus led Jairus, Jesus led this little girl's mother into the room. And he took hold of the girl's hand and said to her, Little girl, I tell you to get up. And Jesus did what nobody else could do. He not only healed this little girl, he raised her back to life gave her, gave the parents the gift of life again. And as we see, if we put our trust in Jesus, when all else has failed, all other avenues, all other means that we have attempted and tried has failed, our faith is still well placed. As long, as long as the words we use, the thoughts that we have reflect trust. As long as we keep listening to Jesus and not letting anybody else's opinions take us away from trusting. And as long as we believe that Jesus can do what nobody else can. Life isn't easy, is it? There are times that we try our best to solve problems, but it just seems like there's setback after setback, failure after failure. And after so long, we think there's no other options, there's no other possibilities, but we see there is always one, and that is Jesus. And that if we put our trust and faith in Him, it is well placed, even if everything else we have tried has come up empty and with failure. It's no wonder. It should be no surprise to us why trust can be our greatest strength and asset. May this be another lesson that strengthens our trust today. God bless and amen.
us come before God, shall we? In our prayers of the people today, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another powerful message that reminds us why trust can be our greatest strength and asset. We give our thanks and we give our praise, God, because you and you alone can do the impossible. And we thank you that no situation is ever hopeless. Just as you said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. May that be our motto. May that be our way of living each and every day. May those be words we recite in the morning, recite at noon, recite at night, and recite the next day. So that if there's ever a trial or challenge, we won't be afraid. We will make that choice to trust and make it our greatest strength. So thank you for that. We want to pray for the many who are going through health issues at this time, God. It might be one of us. It might be a loved one. It might be a family member. It might be a friend. It might be a colleague. Whoever, God, we just lift them up in prayer and ask for your hand of healing upon them. You healed the woman who was sick with chronic bleeding. You healed Jairus' daughter. May you heal those who are being remembered in this prayer right now. We pray for those who are experiencing grief. There is crying and wailing happening in our world today as a result of loss and suffering. So we pray for those, God, who are going through this. And may you take away that grief. May you comfort them in this time of solace. May they have tears of joy rather than tears of sorrow. We pray as well, God, for those who are struggling to make ends meet. It's not easy out there, God. Incomes are fixed. Prices are going up. And we just ask, God, that those who are in desperate need, that they'll just reach out to you and say, God, I am desperate, but I am not hopeless. Help us, God. Help us. Provide for us. And I believe. May that be their prayer. And may they see your power at work. And we pray as well, God, for those who are just emotionally spent. So many are just feeling so overwhelmed, whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, whether it's hopelessness. May they realize, God, that they can find power and strength in you, that your power will flow into them just as your power flowed into this woman who had been suffering for so long. And may we, God, pray for the lost. We know there are many out there. Some might be our family members, friends, neighbors, and so on. Help us to be positive witnesses in our life, God, so that others will come to know of you, have a faith, have a belief, and realize that you and you alone are God. So we give our thanks for this time of prayer. You know our needs, God. We lift them up to you at this time, and we know you're listening. We know you're acting. We know you'll respond in your perfect way. So God, be with us. We thank you that in a few short moments we'll be able to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. May it be a blessing. May it be a time of remembrance. May it be a time of joy and celebration. We offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. Let us join now in singing. We offer this prayer in Christ's name, 
Amen. According to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, we do this. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And after he gave thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. I invite you now to pull back the first layer, and we join together in the communion wafer, Christ's body broken for us.
may you continue to support in your worship to God. After the benediction, we will sing, Go Now in Peace. So, let us conclude with our benediction today. May the road rise up to greet thee. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warmly upon thy face and the rain fall softly upon thy fields. And until we meet again, may God hold each one of us safely in the palm of his hand. God bless. Amen. Have a blessed week and we will see you next time.